hit the record button. There we go. Okay. Awesome. I didn't even need to be reminded about that. Perfect. Um, so uh, I think we're, we're good in terms of introductions. Right? I see Jessica in the room. Jessica, are you going to be hopping around from room to room? Is that the game plan or are you That's sticking That's my with game it? plan. All right. I'm, I'm going to stay and then I'll roll in a minute. Sounds good. <laughs> Sounds good. So, um, so I think we don't need to do much, or should we do introductions? Might as well do introduction and introductions. I think most of us know each other, but it might be good to yeah. just um, say a quick name and um, who, who you're representing today. Any, any uh, group or organization or agency you, you represent. So Philip, since I see you on the screen, why don't you start? Okay, well, my name is Phil Wu and uh, I'm not sure who I represent, but I, I guess uh, most immediately I'll say the Oregon Environmental Council. Excellent. Uh, John, you wanna go next? Sure, John Gardner, uh, TriMet. And I would say I'm, I'm representing only our Transit Equity Inclusion Community Affairs Department. We have all kinds of other folks looking at this work, but this is really to make sure that we take into, I think primarily today's conversation into consideration, so. Excellent, thank you. Kari? So Kari Schlosshauer, she, her pronouns, and I'm with the Safe Routes Partnership. Excellent. Everybody knows Jessica, so. <laughs> She's floating around. Uh, what about Sam? Uh, Sam Roberts, I'm with the WSP project team. I'm just here to take notes on the Jamboard. Perfect, Josh. Hey, Josh Channel, project team. I think you all know me from yeah. the earlier EMAC meetings. Nice to see everybody again. Yeah, yeah. and then Amanda. Hey everyone, Amanda Garcia Snell, um, Community Engagement Manager in Washington County and representing Washington County and she, her pronouns. Awesome. And Chris Lepe, you all know me, I think uh, by now, uh, helping out with the project team. And, um, and so I just wanted to call out real quick. So John, thank you for um, uh, reporting out for us today. So we have to figure that one out. Uh, so we have a report out. And as I mentioned before, um, Sam is gonna be taking notes for us. Um, so just to kind of center us around the, the purpose of our conversation um, again here. So uh, we're here to create a greater understanding within EMAC of the preferred policy and strategy options for affordability that will be prepared for the EMAC re recommendations and just kind of get some forward momentum on those policy and strategy recommendations. Um, so we invite you to share your ideas without limitation. We're here to listen, learn, and search for understanding. Of course, be respectful um, of your time speaking and allow for all voices to be heard. We have about 20 or so minutes, 20, 23 minutes to, to work through, uh, through our two questions here today. So um, does anybody have any questions before we dive into the meat of the matter? No, good to go. All right. So first, um, we're going to talk about the research document, which is um, we already started getting a little bit of input on that. That was great input, by the way. Um, so um, if you can find and open the affordability research document, uh, have that in front of you there. And, um, and our question really is about uh, what is your reaction to the key takeaways in, in the research document? So I know that um, already mentioned about the, uh, the fact that transit or transit riders won't be impacted. Uh, definitely concur with, with that, uh, that kind of counterpoint. So um, I think we can, we can make some changes to that uh, moving forward. Other, other thoughts and, uh, and questions or, or um, yeah, any input as it relates to the research document, any takeaways, anything, you know, did you like it? Um, was there was there some kind of concerns, any red flags? I had a couple of thoughts and I, I see how they sort of overflow and interact with the policy and strategy document as well. But um, I did have a question about, um, what page was it on? Page five. Um, looking at and and I saw this as as one of the one of the findings. Um, this idea of um, being able to what was it reduce the amount of the fee after a person had sort of gone over a certain number of trips, which just made me think about. I was curious if there had been any research or if there was any thinking about whether that would actually encourage potentially a little bit more driving um, if someone were close to the cutoff and they wanted to be able to get that lower rate for their trips, that they then would be taking actually extra trips and 
that sort of policy might have an unintended consequence of causing more vehicle miles traveled, more congestion on the, the roadway in order for someone who's a local who knows that there's, you know, 18, 18 trips cut off and they're at 16 and so they take two extra trips or something uh, like that in order to, to reach that lower rate. Mm -hmm. Which one of these are you, are you? Uh... Uh, let's see. Or oh, wait a minute, there, oh, research one. Sorry, I was in the wrong document. Yeah, the research, right. There we go. So page five, you said? Mm hmm It was on um, under number seven, where it says credits once a certain number of trips are taken per month. And I think in the policy document, there was, maybe it was this one. I can't remember. One of the two documents showed, I think it was an example of where this is applied in a particular place. And I think it was, the number was 18 in that particular example where it's oh, okay. you know, after the 18th trip, I think Garrett said, you know, the, the price essentially drops by half. So instead of paying $1.50 for each trip, you're paying 75 cents. And so if that's the incentive, and you're close to that cutoff, does that then encourage someone to take more trips than are needed in order to re reach that discounted rate? Great, awesome. Uh, Josh is, uh is one of our subject matter experts here. Any, any uh, thoughts on that? Uh, only that it seems pretty intuitive to me that that could happen. Um, I, I don't know that there's any research on it yet. It, yeah. it, you, you have to set the bar pretty, pretty high in order to make sure that um, you're, not, you're not getting a big effect from that, I would think. Mm -hmm. but set the bar for the number of trips pretty high. I mean, it, it would seem to me, uh, just based on, you know, the 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 examples that were cited and the research that was sort of quoted that there really isn't all that much robust information out there um, and so you know these key takeaways are sort of built on not exactly the the most solid foundation of of of, of research so I think that's a caveat that we just have to be aware of but mm. you know this credit thing was interesting to me because. You know, I, I think about the um, the uh, honored uh, citizen rate on TriMet, where um, you know, uh, on a monthly basis, when you reach a certain amount of dollars spent, then it's capped, and then every trip after that is essentially mm -hmm. free. And and does that incent someone to make more trips? Um, and personally, it actually does, because mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's what I found myself doing was feeling much freer to hop on to a bus or max when that monthly um, cap was was reached, you know, uh, for that quote honored citizen rate. So I would imagine the same thing might happen with the uh, uh, with a tolling cap or a credit. If only we had an expert in this group from TriMet who might be able to speak to that. <laughs> well, I mean, I think that gets back to uh, what Kari said, right? So it's opposite. So our fair capping, you're right. Like once you get to the cap, you will pay no more and you can use the system as much as you want as however you want, because there's a, there's a maximum. But, it, but in the example of, you know, um, capping the amount we charge folks, I do think we don't necessarily want folks that feel more free to use the public uh, highway <laughs> right. system. So like it could have an in adverse uh, impact. So I think I'm with Kari on that one. I think there are, are, I think there are better things. One of the things I just thought about when you were saying that was um, car sharing or carpooling and incentivizing that, or, you know what I mean? So to, I don't know how that would look, but I didn't, I don't think I saw that in any, any of the other examples, but, you know, I think hopefully that would be a normal thing that people start trying to do, but I wonder if we could, provide supports for that or incentivize that if we're really trying to remove cars or reduce cars, not remove cars. Well, and I also to that um, point that um, credits for take for different commute times, um, I thought that was interesting. I think it sort of lends itself to a, a flexibility that not everyone may actually have, especially low income folks who have less flexibility in their work sometimes. Um, but the other thing, when I first read that thinking about credits, I thought it was referring to transit. And so it was like, oh, the more, if you ride transit, you get credit, like somehow the system is so connected that you could get uh, 
to whole credits. Um, uh, but that might be affording way too much technological advancement to the whole um, and, col and collaboration and coordination to the whole system. Well, I guess to the extent that there is somewhere in that uh, a strategy piece, something about interoperability with the uh, between the systems, then maybe that could work. Yeah, it, it is in use in other regions. So yeah, I think. Yeah, I thought I saw something in the, maybe the policy document about that. Yeah, maybe it, I saw it. Sure. I think in LA, right? Yeah, are you describing where they you take a certain number of uh, transit trips and they they give you credit for a toll credit? Is that what yeah. you're well, maybe was yeah. that maybe yeah, that was LA, laid out yeah. in the example? Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. No, so um, however, you know, so we're talking. We've got we've got these other buckets, right? We've got the neighborhood health and safety. We've got the uh, transit and multimodal uh, investments piece, and here we're talking about affordability. Um, as another consideration in, in order to have uh, equitable advancement uh, as part of this program. For those folks that just are not going to jump onto transit, there's just no way, right, either because of their profession or uh, where they live. Um, were there any of the, of the affordability strategies in the research document um, that, that sort of uh, you felt were were solid that you really liked for for that kind of family or for that that uh, group of folks that just are not going to be able to to shift and you know in an, in a status quo kind of tolling approach would be uh, potentially burdened by by the tolls. Yeah, I well, mean, I think the oh, sorry, go ahead. I was just gonna. I. Uh, my, my my question probably doesn't really directly answer that question, <laughs> but I had I needed a bit of clarification around number two, and I think that sort of relates to your question. So, um, John, I don't know if you want to go first. I can ask for my clarification afterwards. Or... Amanda, number two being which one in the research document? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the okay. is like. Let's look at that. So are you talking about this year? Yeah, so I was trying to understand how that works. Like um, the this idea that people who are traveling at the busiest time are paying higher tolls, do, are the tolls, is the idea that tolls are cost more during the busy time or that we're only tolling during, like we're only charging during the busy time or both or either or neither? Mm -hmm. Uh, Josh, do you have a, a precise answer? My assumption is that the tolls vary over time, but I'm not clear as to whether there's going to be a period where people aren't going to pay tolls. Has that been decided yet? No, we don't know if there's going to be a minimum toll rate um, or a zero toll rate at times, uh, but um, congestion pricing, of course, works best when you uh, price higher the most congested times a day to keep people moving. So um, it, it would be variable based on time of day. It depends on the goal, right? So if your goal is revenue con collection, then you might still charge during off-peak travel times. But if your goal is, uh, for example, smoothing the traffic and and not creating, you know, not having congestion, then um, then you know, really focusing on those peak period uh, toll rates is um, is obviously critical. Okay, and then so my you, mm -hmm. go ahead. My follow-up question to that, just when we're thinking about. Um, spending behavior and all of that jazz. It seemed like a lot of this research, or a lot of this um, referenced a document from 2008. Hmm. And my, my concern would be that yeah. the actual data in that document is pre-recession, right? Like it's 2007. And so um, how, what, I didn't fine tooth comb this policy document. So I don't know if there is a limitation section and this was discussed and if there is, I'm sorry, but the, um, but my question is like, what do we know about how accurate or not accurate that might be in terms of the, the shift in people's spending behavior now that we're, um, you know, 13 years later and a lot of changes in the economy. And especially now, I know we don't, we aren't really going to know, right? Like what the the commute environment might look like once we come through COVID. So, so there's that. Yeah, I agree. I caught that too, actually. Um, 
in terms of that the the year of, uh, that it says right there. I think is this what you're referring to? Well, we got this 2008 document. Which yeah, is that great, but. that primer is like cited multiple times, and I don't know how much of the assumptions come from that information, but to me, like feels like things have changed. Yeah, some things have changed, including sort of the um, uh, kind of perspective, at least here in this region, about what the context of what e uh, equity uh, means in congestion pricing. I feel like there's been also from the federal government to where we are back in 2008 to where we are here in this area, there's there's uh, a little bit of a shift too. But yeah, there was a data point somewhere along the, I, I know what you're talking about, somewhere along the way that it was, uh, it was like a 2008 or something like that. So, okay, it's a good point. Uh, any other thoughts on the research document or should, should we move on? Uh, Josh, probably a good idea to move on to the um, the recommendation section, yeah? Well, I, I, I just want to make one strategy. comment. Sure, sure. Um, and, and that was, I, I found the piece, uh, I guess, number six. Okay. Um, uh, you know, just about tolling, supporting, transit mm -hmm. um, to be very interesting. Um, and uh, I especially found that interesting from the perspective of uh, the impact on climate. Mm -hmm. um, because from if we, if, we, if we were taking climate into, into consideration, then of course we would want to encourage uh, the development of transit and greater options in that respect. Uh, of course, what this seems to suggest is that one would have to be very careful in how those investments are made because of the equity implications. And um, um, I, I, I would like to learn more about that, not necessarily in, in this particular session, but I think that's mm -hmm. an interesting thing to try to uh, sort of uh, tease out. Yeah. <laughs> I had a, a thought on that as well, which I was sort of initially thinking about when with your comment, John, and then I think also this one as well. For Phil. Mm -hmm. And I think it, it does bridge a little bit to the policy document, but um, I think, you know, my understanding and of the work that we're doing is to determine what sort of investments need to be made before this tolling program starts. And so this seems like almost one of the ones at the very, very top that um, should be addressed where if this is an issue, then we should make sure that there is a significant bucket of funding that would go towards transit to improve transit for all of those reasons that you brought up, John. Um, and we should be workshopping this. I mean, once we figure out, you know, that this is the policy priority that we wanna move forward, um, then there should be some significant work that's done to go out and ask the people in this area what transit service they want to, mm -hmm. to dig into that right. and, and to make sure that that funding is allocated and make sure that that is in place right. and make sure that it's not buses that are going to be stuck in the traffic that's going to show up and so that they're bustling, you know, like whatever all those right. are, that's the work that yeah. we're doing right now. So I thought this was an interesting thing to highlight. And I think it's really important to note that if this is not well thought out, I absolutely agree. Not all transit spending helps low income. That's right. Yeah. Um, but the whole reason we're here is to fix that and make sure that doesn't happen, right? Right. And to under, well, we have yes. to understand it. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so so that, that but, we we don't make a yeah. mistake in that respect, right? Right. But but, then, but more work needs to be done. I mean, I think there's a significant amount of work that needs to be done that we can't do through research, and we can't certainly do through just waiting until this program starts. But that should be part of this tolling program to say you know, okay, we've identified transit, for example, as something that's really, really important. Now let's go out and workshop because we know this is an issue. Go talk to low-income writers and find out who yeah. in this area, like what exactly they need and then make sure that the OTC is allocating enough funding for this so that we can solve this and it doesn't become a problem for this program. And then there's another element of this uh, that, I, that I just want to bring up, which is, so if we were thinking about low income populations and giving them discounts or credits is something that they immediately will feel. So in other words, it'll be a very much a dollars and cents impact that they can see. However, 
you know, making alternative investments in transit, even if those are very well thought out and very well targeted, will be less transparent and less directly felt, um, especially if we're not even certain how many of those dollars from the revenues will actually go into those investments. Yeah, I'm, I'm mean, not sure I, if I've so made, I'm quick, not sure if I articulated no, I that mean, very well. I, I think I think you did, and to me, I mean, any of this stuff is like public information. When, like we could set percentages or plans or or volume. I guess to me, the section reads a little weird, and I just get back to like, what is the goal? Why are we tolling again? Right, and and so I think someone said it earlier, like. Uh, bus riders are not suddenly going to jump on the freeways if it's cheaper to pay a toll that used to never exist, right? So they're, so you're not going to create more drivers. Really, the question is, are people going to take bus if, it's, if there's too many barriers to using the public freeways? So how do we reduce those barriers for low-income populations, right? So, so to me, I think we're, we're getting a little left, because you can, I think Kari's right, we should workshop, like, how could we avoid these problems because I mean, again, are we trying to reduce congestion? <laughs> so, and where does that congestion go? And if the yeah. bus systems are not attractive for whatever reasons to people who could actually use them to get where they need to go in a reliable, time-sensitive matter, it won't. So, it won't matter. But I just, I worry we're getting a little into weeds. And this section was a little anti-bus, I got to say, <laughs> as opposed to how do we you. improve the system to make yeah. it better. So again, it just was kind of an interesting thing. But I just get back to what's the goal and where are these drivers in these cars going to go who yeah. can't afford it? But but we never did answer the recommendations. Eight seconds, y'all. <laughs> and I'm, sorry, I'm so yeah. sorry because I know you had your hand up. Um, maybe you could drop something in a chat or so.